Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all your faces. You know, it's, uh, it's good to be part of the family of God. Praying this morning, and, and someone just prayed about how just wonderful it is to be part of the family of God. And it is just amazing. It can be as shallow as we want, those relationships, or it can be as deep as we want. It's up to each and every one of us. We can make of this relationship in the church whatever we desire. And so I just want to encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of the blessing and the gift that God has given us to be part of a family of God. Amen? All right. Let's pray, and then we'll uh, worship the Lord in song. Uh, Father, I'm just so grateful, Lord, for this morning. I'm excited about your word, Lord. Excited about the moving of your spirit in our lives, God, to see what you will do. And, Lord, just the impact that you will have on people for the sake of your kingdom and for your glory, Lord. Lord Jesus, we pray for your spirit to fall upon us, God, in such a way that would move us, uh, shake us out of our, our normal everyday lives, Lord, uh, to live a life uh, filled with the Spirit, God, moved with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, God. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you would just uh, uh, manifest yourself to us in a real way, Lord, for your glory and for your praise. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Would you like to stand with me this morning? When my 
strength is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. But still my soul will sing your praise on in Ten thousand years and then
voices one more time.
Find my strength in the name. Find my strength in the name of the Lord. Jesus, my Savior. And yes, you are. Jesus, my Savior. You will not falter. Amen. Okay, you can sit down if you'd like. And, uh, so just so everybody knows, this is Mr. Matt Hansen and his lovely bride, Angie. Come to uh, just join the family of Christ here in Kanab and serve, and what a blessing. Amen? I'm feeling it. Oh, she's like, oh, wait. Phew. Praise God. Thankful, thankful. I'd like to invite our, our elder up to pray over our tithes and offerings. And Good morning. to read from Proverbs 3. My son, do not forget my law, but, keep, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son and in whom he delights. Our dear Father, we'd just like to thank you for all that you do for us. We'd like to thank you for 
the work you're doing here in Kanab and in this church and just pray your blessings over everyone here and over this church and the work you're doing here and just pray that you watch over protect Will and Roxanne as they lead and direct us and that you just fill them with your Holy Spirit and that they'll guide us in the direction that you want us to go just thank you for the ways you've blessed our lives and just pray that you'll put it on our hearts to to use wisely the things that you've blessed us with and we thank you for all you do again in Jesus name
Is that me? There we are. All right. It says, uh, the, the theme for this month's potluck is the Super Bowl. See, we're going to be a little late. Super Bowl, we'll just celebrate whoever wins. Anyway, sign up the information desk out there and, and cook your favorite soup or bring a side dish that goes with soup. I'm guessing that's salad or breadsticks or something like that. I'm a soup fan, so I'm. Ex- you guys got a favorite soup? What's your favorite soup? Tomato soup. Yeah, I'm a fan of it. Cabbage. All right. Okay, I'm good for that. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds sounds fun, huh? We'll gather together. We'll, we'll taste everybody's soups. I think last time we had like 11 soups. I tasted every single one of them. It was awesome. So please come and, and you know, and we're going to focus on our, our focus this year is, is missions and what the Lord will do with this church in regard to the great uh, call, right? The call was to go and make disciples and teaching them everything that Jesus taught. That's the call. If you're a, a Christian, that's, that was your marching orders before Jesus left. Go and make disciples, disciplined followers of Jesus. It's as simple as that. We're not, to go, we're not out to save the world. That's not our job. That's his. We're just to go and make disciples, teaching people what Jesus taught us. That's pretty easy. We can do that. And so in regards to that, I am actually leaving this Thursday and going to Mexico. And on a fact-finding thing, we're going to go look at, I think, some, uh, an orphanage and a, um, possibly a rehab center that we might be able to support and encourage and um, just minister to. Uh, It's a desire of of my heart for this church to be a doing church, a serving church. Not only here in our Jerusalem, but in our Samaria and to the ends of the earth, our Judea and to the ends of the earth. And so um, I'll be doing that. Um, Also, I met a little lady, she came up yesterday, Jane. And uh, she heads up the Kanab Community Mobile Food Pantry. This is actually the Utah Food Bank. And they saw a need here in Kanab, and so they send a truck up once a month and give out food. There's no requirements. It's, she made, she, she says, <laughs> people are hilarious. She goes, it's not a Mormon thing. <laughs> Just because it's held at the, at the church in their parking lot, she says that she's felt that there was a, 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 a huge, whatever, that people just weren't promoting this. There's this free food for people that need food. And all you have to do is sign your name and take the food. They don't ask you any questions. Just, so if you have needs, she told me also that you can collect up to for five families. So if you know five families that need food, you can go and pick it up for them and take it to them. Maybe they can't get out. And so uh, she said, would you be willing to promote that? I says, well, absolutely. Jesus wanted to feed the masses. Why wouldn't we? And if we can use you to do that, even better. And so, but also they need, they need volunteers, right? It's, if you want to go and help, I think this is a great opportunity. If I was here, I would go do this. It's a great opportunity to meet people who have needs in the community on a personal level. You can look them in the face, say, hi, my name's Will. Who are you? Blah, blah, blah. Invite them to come to church. Invite them to come to our Super Bowl and have a bowl of soup with us. Yeah, I just look, it's just an opportunity it's an opportunity to serve and to share the gospel. So if you'd be interested in this, this is going to be out on the front. And uh, you can call that number there and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer and help on February 10th. And so I think it's a great opportunity for us. Anyway, that's our announcements. Oh, one other thing. If, we have, if you have these and you have a prayer need for us or for yourself or for whoever, please fill this out. and Put it in the agape box or give it to an elder or give it to me that we might know how we might more efficiently pray for you, right?
Because as we, we, we looked at last week, sometimes we don't know what we ought to pray for. And thank God that he's given us the Holy Spirit that can pray on our behalf for those things that we don't know what we ought to pray for. Don't we have such a good God? Rats. Bought a brand new microphone and it's still doing the same thing. Is everything else off? It's got to be one of those receivers. Anyway, Romans chapter 9, if you would, please, as we just continue our study through, through God's Word. In Romans chapter 8, we finished with this wonderful section that says, Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That should spark you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. To those who have trusted in Jesus, gave their life to Him, and have accepted the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. I believe it began with God. I believe God so loved us to begin with that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe on Him would not perish. The love of God has existed far beyond when we began to consider loving God. Once we come to that saving faith, that saving knowledge of, of the grace of God, and, and that's we've been sealed with the Spirit of God in our lives, nothing can separate us from that. That is a powerful, powerful statement. And we need to hold on to that when we feel like we're unloved. We're going through the book of Job. How many of you come on Wednesday nights? How many of you have, Job felt like he wasn't loved by God anymore, didn't he? He's like, he's, he's left me. He's turned me over to the enemy. He's, he's so far from me, he doesn't talk to me anymore. And, but that was so far from the truth, wasn't it? God finally spoke again in chapter 38. Praise God. Finally started speaking to Job again and, and to, to realize that God never left Job. He's letting him go through some things in life, but he loves Job. Job was never separated from the love of God. Anyway, so, but Father, we just come before you, Lord. I, I just pray over your word. Uh, God, it is powerful. It is strong. Uh, Lord, it is true. And so, Lord, I, I ask that you would bring it to life today, that you would speak through it uh, to us, Lord. May we open our ears and our hearts to hear what the Spirit would say today to the church, God. And Lord, I, I am grateful for the promises of God, Lord, that are, are sure and, and forever, Lord, and they stand fast. So God, I pray, uh, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, manifest yourself through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. So he goes from this statement of that nothing can separate me, from, separate me from the love of God to, man, I'm just grieving in my heart. What's that all about? He says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. He says, yes, I know nothing can separate us from the love of God, and yet I grieve for my brethren, my countrymen, my fellow Israelites, my fellow Jewish brothers. I grieve for them. Why would Paul be grieving for the nation of Israel at this point in time? Why do you think that is? Because 
Jesus came walking by and they totally missed him. They missed their Messiah, the one that they've been waiting for all their lives. The ones that God, that, that God, he says, um, oops, I turned the wrong page. Um, he says, uh, the ones who were of the adoption for the glory of God, the one that God gave the covenants to, the giving of the law, the one that called, God called them to serve him and to grab a hold of his promises. You see, Paul, Paul was a, was a Jew of Jews, right? He was as religious as they came, and yet he realized one day on his way to Damascus that he hadn't seen the light of God. Matter of fact, he'd totally missed God. God had walked right by him in the flesh, and he didn't, didn't see him. Matter of fact, the, the nation of Israel, for the most part, denied Jesus, right? They denied him because they loved their religion more than they loved God. That was the problem. And, and, and so Paul, in, in, in realizing that the love of God is so wonderful and, and, and so glorious, looks at his brethren and his heart just breaks for him. How about you? When you look at your family, when you look at your community, you look at the people you work with and, and you spend your time with that are unsaved, they have no knowledge of God in their life, they have no need for God in their life, does your heart break for them? Do you grieve for them? Do you go home and literally just like, I, Lord, I remember my brother. My heart was just broken for my brother. He's my only brother. I got eight sisters. So my heart really wasn't bent towards them. It was bent towards my brother. No, I love my sisters too. But I remember after I got born again uh, and I began walking with God and I would look at my brother and I would realize, oh my gosh, he's in great peril. He had no use for God in his life. I prayed before his death that, that he did have a meeting with Jesus. I, I prayed. I don't know. But we should, as Christians, you know, that's, Paul has the heart of Christ, does he not? When Jesus came into the world, he was brokenhearted over the people and their sin. And he loved them enough to come and give himself for them. You know, how often did Jesus, when he would come into Jerusalem, he would sit up on that hill before coming in, and he would cry and weep over the city and the people. His heart was broken for them. That's the call for us, folks. If we don't have that in our life, if you're going through your daily life, and when you talk to people and you realize that they're not born again, if it doesn't grieve your heart, do a check, please. Check your heart. Where are you at? Is this Christian life you're walking? Is it just superficial? Is it just on the surface? There's no real depth to it? Repent. Ask God to give you a heart for the broken and the lost. And, and so that's Paul. But he talks about these Israelites. You know, he says, you know, they were, a, do you know they were a special people unto God? Do you know that? Do you know that they still are a special people unto God? In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, God speaking to Moses, he said, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. God chose the children of Jacob, the nation of Israel, to be a special people above all the peoples of the earth. And I, and I couldn't find it, but I know it says in there, not because there's anything special with you. You're not special in and of yourselves, but simply I have chosen you for a special purpose. Because the Israelites were a bunch of knuckleheads. You guys know that, right? Rebellious, disobedient, sinful, arrogant. I mean, these guys couldn't go a week without disobeying God, it seems, if you read the Old Testament. Just constantly rebelling against God. And yet God says, you're a special, a special treasure 
to me. I find that just amazing. Because the special purpose that God created them for was to be a light to lead people to God. That was their purpose. That's why he made them a special people above all people, that they might be very visual before the world and the world would see them and want what they have for themselves, want to worship the great I am. That was why. But you see, there was a problem in Paul's day because they had replaced the relationship with God for a relationship with their religion. They had totally missed their Messiah. And so it says that, uh, did you guys see in verse 5, it says, For Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. This is probably the most simplistic and straightforward declaration that Jesus is God. A lot of people have a problem with that. They want Jesus to be just the Son of God, a prophet of God, a light, a great teacher. No, no, no. If that's all Jesus is, you're, it's superficial, folks. He is the eternally blessed God. Amen. When I, when I, you know, I don't know how many times I've read this, but that just like slapped me in the face yesterday. It is so blatant. You can't miss it. Paul, do you think he was intentional when, when God inspired him to write this? I believe he was. Jesus Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. If anybody has a problem when you're talking with, of who, about who Jesus is, let's have them read that. Say, would you go read Romans 9, 5? If you have a question about who Jesus really is, he is God in the flesh. Verse 6, it says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For at this time, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So he's talking to the, to the nation of Israel. He says, you know, God gave them his word and yet they didn't follow it. So Paul makes this statement. He says, is it because the word of God has no effect? The word of God has no power? No. It's not. The word of God is powerful. The problem is, it said they, they are not all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Okay? So there was a, basically, if you talk to, even today, you go to the Orthodox Jewish, they call them the black hatters now. You know, they've got the black hat, the black robes, the curls. And, and, and you go to these guys, the, the Orthodox Jewish people, and, and you will talk to them, and it says, well, why are you saved? Why are you have a... And they says, because we are of the seed of Abraham. We're of the children of Abraham. And that's what gets us in. There was a teaching that actually said that, that Abraham used to sit or sits at the gates of hell. And he watches as people are coming into hell, and he looks. And when he sees one that's of the nation of Israel, he pulls them out and says, no... You're of the seed of Abraham. You're mine. You belong to me. And so you don't get to go to hell. They actually teach, taught that. It's in the Mishnah. But that's totally contrary to God's word, isn't it? Because Paul said here, all of Israel are not necessarily those who are of the seed of Abraham. You know, just because you were born into a nice Christian home and your parents were born again, doesn't mean you are. Just because grandma was born again and, and, and she went to church every day and she prayed every day doesn't mean that your mom and dad were born again. Doesn't mean that you are. You see, there's only children of God in heaven, not grandchildren of God in heaven. 
You see, we don't get in on somebody else's shirt tail. You know, I always ask people, I say, so, so when was you born again? Well, you know, I was born into a Christian. <laughs> was that it? Uh, no, no, that's not it. Traditions as well, right? You know, the Jewish people, are the, are, they're full of traditions. And a lot of people think their traditions are salvation as well. They're not. Just because you go through all those rituals does not mean you're born again or saved. You're just practicing your religion. You see, because who are those who are children of God? The children of the promise. You see, and he uses uh, Abraham here, and he talks about, he says, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. You remember that was the promise that God made Abraham, that Sarah will conceive and bear a son, even though she's, a, she's an elderly lady, right? And, and, uh, but we know that, that Abraham actually had two sons, didn't he? He had Ishmael, his eldest son, by his maid, Hagar, right? And then he had Isaac, which did come from Sarah. So here we have the child of the flesh, the seed of the flesh, and the seed of the spirit, or the seed of the promise. Ishmael and Isaac. You see, God promised that Sarah, Sarah's child, would be the one to inherit the promises of God. Ishmael was just a work of Abraham's flesh. That's all he was. He's a child of the flesh. And you know, this is where we get the two nations as well. We got the Arab nations came through Ishmael. We have the Jewish nation came from Isaac. And they have been at odds with each other ever since. I got to give you a special note, though. God blessed Ishmael. When, when Hagar and him left, when God told Abraham, she, she and that child have got to go because they have no portion in the promises that I'm giving to Isaac. God did not just kick him out and leave him without. No, as a matter of fact, he blessed Ishmael and said he would be a nation of 12 princes and that he would have great wealth. Is that not true? Not the Arab nations? They have great wealth. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Syria, the, the oil reserves. They're wealthy. They're, they're blessed people. But the promise, the promise came through Isaac. And he says... Uh, but not only that, verse 10 through 13 says, not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So now he brings up another example. He says the first example of the children of God that are, that are they're born again of the promise was, was Abraham's children. But he says, now I got another example for you, Rebekah and Isaac. And we know that Rebekah and Isaac had two sons as well, twins as a matter of fact, Jacob and Esau, right? You know the story? And so... Uh, um, so two sons, twins are born, but they were as different as night and day, weren't they? Jacob and Esau, uh, Jacob was kind of a mama's boy, liked to play the guitar and do puzzles and sit at home, and Esau liked to go hunting and fishing and camping, and he was daddy's boy, right? So they're just totally different in nature. But you see, God had made a, 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 a tradition that the eldest son was the heir, right? And so Esau was declared to be the heir of, of all things, and yet we know that God didn't choose Esau to be the heir. 
but he chose the younger son. That's why he said, uh, the older shall serve the younger. And we know that when they came to Isaac for the blessing, instead of doing this, Isaac did this. And he blessed the younger one, Jacob. And we know that Jacob went on to have 12 children, right? And the 12 tribes of Israel, right? But a lot of people, they say, you know, I have a problem with this. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. But if we go back up, we realize the reason that God chose the younger one, the reason that God didn't stick with the program, that it, it, it wasn't a formula, that God doesn't work through traditions. God doesn't do that, does he? He, he seems to just mix stuff up all the time. He never does the same thing twice. Jesus would heal a leper by telling him to go dip yourself, you know, in the, in, and then come back. And then other times, you know, he would just touch the blind man. And, he'd be, and then other times he'd spit in the mud and rub it in his face. And, and he'd always do things different. Because God doesn't want us to get stuck into thinking that this is the only way that he works. We got to set up a children's program. And, and then, you know, we can save children. If we got this really good program. No, God says, you know what? Walk by spirit and faith and let my spirit move and I'll work in these kids and I'll do it differently all the time. And so that's what God's doing because he says he's going to do this that the purpose of God according to election might stand. That God's choice, God will choose who he's going to use. God will raise up who he desires to. That's the point he's making here. A lot of people, they take this Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and they say, I don't like that. See, God is preferential. No, it's according to the covenant. I loved Jacob for the covenant that I was going to give him, that I was going to bestow upon him. Esau wasn't a good choice for the covenant. I didn't want Esau for that. So that's why he says he didn't actually hate, like we think, hate Esau. He just chose Jacob over Esau, right? I love Guy for the job, but I hate George for that job, <laughs> right? That's what he's saying. There was a lady came to, to Charles Spurgeon one time, and, and, and he was teaching on this, and she came up to him, and she said, I, I just really have a problem with this. And Charles Spurgeon looked at her and said, you know what? I do too. I have a real problem with this. I can't see how God loved Jacob. Because it, do, you, do, you, do you see what we said there? It says, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil. Do you see, God chose Jacob before they were even born. He had a purpose planned for Jacob's life. It wasn't that Jacob was a better guy than Esau. As a matter of fact, if you read, that, you know that they weren't. Jacob was a conniver. He was shifty, beady little eyes. He was sneaky, deceitful. You see, he wasn't any better than his brother Esau. God didn't choose Jacob because he was better, more well-behaved, more spiritual. No. God just simply said, Jacob's my guy. And so he chose Jacob. You know, it's the same for us, folks. You know, God has a plan for your life. And, and, and maybe you would look around and you'd say, but that guy's so much better qualified than me to do that. He should be doing it. And God says, no, 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 no. I don't want him. I want you. You say, but I'm not, I don't have the skills. I don't have, and God says, I know. That's why I chose you. Because you're not going to be able to glory in this. You're not going to be able to take credit. People are going to look at you and say, 
There is no way that that guy could do that. That must be God. And you're like, yes, amen. And you know what? It takes a huge load off your shoulders too because you know that you've been called according to God's plans, according to God's purposes, and you don't have to make it work. Just let God move and be faithful and obedient. That's all he asks from you. Be faithful and obedient to the calling. You know, and, and, and I'm, I just want to declare that in my life. I am totally ill-suited to be the pastor of this church. I think a lot of you could go, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I believe that. <laughs> you know, God has given me some skills. He's given the ability to build buildings. We, we do that. Praise God, hey, we built a building. But if anybody's going to get saved in here, if there's going to be any miraculous work of God, by, it's going to be by the Spirit of God. I barely know my Bible. I just, you know, I, I, learned, I learned this last week. I'm just sharing with you what God spoke to me. And I pray that, that he's moving through that. It's, there's nothing, there's much more eloquent people in the church than me. Okay, so God has a plan, he has a purpose, and he chooses who he decides to use. So verse 14, he says, well, what shall we say then? Uh, is there unrighteousness with God? So Paul asks this rhetorical question. Is there unrighteousness with God because he decides and chooses who he wants to use? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. And we say, amen, praise the Lord. Thank you that I don't have to run to show myself worthy of God's mercy because I, I ain't going to get 100 feet before I'm winded and I'm tired and I'm done. And it isn't of my own will. I can't will myself into the mercy of God. I can't. I can't force God's hand. He will have mercy upon whom he chooses to have mercy. And a lot of people say, that's unfair. How can that be? Well, let's keep going. God who shows mercy. Verse 17, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, okay, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say to me then, well, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? Okay, God chose Pharaoh, right, to show his power, and yet he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, I got one question for you. Was Pharaoh really a nice, kind guy towards the Israelites. No. As a matter of fact, he despised them. He hated them. He killed all their firstborn kids. He had a hard heart to begin with towards the Israelites. And basically, God said, he gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And, and it, it's interesting because it says, if you go back to Exodus, you realize it says, and God did this and this, and Pharaoh hardened his own heart against God's word. And then Jesus did this, and, and, and then God hardened, or Jesus, Pharaoh hardened his heart again towards God. Three times, Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God's word till finally said, God, God said, fine, have it your way. And God hardened his heart. Basically, he tempered it. He sealed it. Boom. It will never change from this point on. It was done. Pharaoh played a pretty big part in the hardening of his own heart. But God says, you know what? Fine, I'll give it to you. And, and so, but he says, for this very purpose, I raised up Pharaoh. You see, he put that man 
in that position specifically to use him. And he used him to show what? His power and his glory over all creation. It's an amazing story. If you haven't read Exodus, you need to read it. It is powerful. And every one of those plagues and, and storms and flights and was all directed against the gods of these, this earth to show that God was greater than all of those. And God used Pharaoh for that very purpose. And so you say, all right, if God created me that way, then who can judge me? You have no right to judge me, God. How many of you had, I've said this time and time again, you made me this way. You made me with these faults. I know you did. And so how can I be to blame? Well, Paul addressed this earlier in Romans. You, you, am I the only guy that's ever said that to God? Please say no. Please, come on, give me a chance. All right, thank you, thank you, yes. You made me this way. How can you find fault in me then? If, if I'm your creation, you, God says, well, wait a minute. Even though I've created that, you that way, there's still personal responsibility in your life. You still have to do what's right. You know what's right and wrong. That doesn't give you carte blanche to just do whatever you... Just because you have those weaknesses doesn't mean you get to just buckle into them. You agree? God didn't create you to just give in to sin. No. Fight it. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. You have reason in your mind. And you have responsibility. You do. God never relinquished that responsibility from us. He says, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? I've said that time and time again. But does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Now we, in our language, when we say one is for honor and one is for dishonor, wait a minute, we're missing the point here. So I got a lump of clay. And I'm, and I'm a potter, and I, I get up that morning and I say, oh, I need a nice display dish, a bowl. I need a nice bowl. I got some really nice fruit, and, and I'm going to have a party, and, and I want to display that fruit very wonderfully, right? So I create this beautiful bowl, and it's got just this gorgeous glaze and, you know, and the gold rim on it, and, and it's just this beautiful vessel that sits on the front table in the foyer, right? And it's got the vegetables and the fruit in there, or whatever, right? It's a vessel of honor. But I also realize I need just a good old utilitarian pot that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it for scrubbing. It's going to be my, my soap and water. I'm going to scrub toilets with that thing and floors and, and wash walls and all, right? This is a vessel, we would call it a vessel of dishonor because it's going to be used for some nasty business. Is that, is that vessel of dishonor, I'm going to use that word, is that not of use to me? Did I not decide what I'm going to use that vessel for? It's not to, to make less of it. When we read this, we read, oh, honor, dishonor. That's not what he's really saying. He's saying, I've created this vessel for a, a special glorious purpose, yes. But I've also created this vessel over here that's going to get into the nitty-gritty, the grind. They're going to go and serve me, and they're going to work. Do you think the potter does not... Which one do you think he's going to use more? I think he's going to use this one over here, this vessel. You see... it. We're taking it out of context. If we read the, the real language, what he's talking about is, is these, these vessels of dishonor are just different vessels. The same potter made them from the same clay. That's the point. He had a purpose for Israel. They were to be a vessel of honor to him. But did God not also have a plan for the Gentiles? 
Yes, he did. And they were rebellious people. They were. That's the point he's making here. That's, this is what Paul's saying. Let's keep it in context and not change it around. It's, God, does God not have that choice to do that? Yes, he does. He's sovereign. He can do with us whatever he wants. He's the potter. We're the clay. We don't get to choose. I wish we could get Potter's Field Ministry here. You guys ever heard of him? Oh, my gosh. He, he makes pottery. He would set up his, and he would actually throw pots. And I like it because he uses that. He, he throws pots, and he makes this beautiful pot. And he says, isn't that awesome? Then he goes, blah. <laughs> and he mashes it. And then he makes something else out of it. And he just goes on and on. And the whole time he's talking, he's got this, this drape over this huge thing over here. And at the end, he pulls it off, and it's this six-foot pot that he's thrown, and it is glorious. It is amazing. It's beautiful. But he says, you know, th this is a vessel of honor, absolutely. But he says, you know, this bowl here that I made for my cereal every morning, I use this every day. This is, see, they, all, they each have their place. And so, but he says, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Whoa. So, a lot of Calvinist, election minded people go, well, see there, God prepared vessels particularly so that he might destroy them. I think they're absolutely wrong in that. Because my Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. As a matter of fact, God would do anything and everything he possibly can that people would not face judgment and would not see destruction. As a matter of fact, God would go to such lengths that he would send himself to die on the cross for the ungodly. So there's something else going on here. And I believe that, that what shines the light on this is that when it says that God endured with much long suffering the vessels prepared for destruction. God endured with long suffering those vessels. You know who prepares themselves for destruction? Look in the mirror. We do that to ourselves. Do you know that God prepared the lake of fire for Satan and his minions? It was never intended for us. It wasn't intended for us. But due to our rebellious nature and our denying of God's salvation, and, and we put ourselves there. God never forces anybody into hell. He never drags anybody in. No. We walk in there willingly of our own desires. That's the truth. If you're a vessel of destruction, it's because you've prepared yourself for that by denying God, by being rebellious to God. But verse 23, it says, that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. When God created us, he created us to have a relationship with Him forever. Is that not true? According to God, did God ever, did God create Adam that He might destroy him? Who's a, does anybody build a house that they might bulldoze it down the minute they're done with it? Does anybody create beautiful things so that they might just smash them to bits? <laughs> Dustin's over here. I don't do that. <clears throat> if I put in a lot of effort and work on things, I, I try to keep it around as long as possible. God's heart wasn't to build us, simply to destroy us. 
Who would ever believe, who would ever teach that? I believe it's absolutely contrary to God's word. But I knew that, do know that we are, God chooses to have, have mercy upon whom he chooses. It's an interesting thing, too, because you could say, well, I believe that's really unfair. I know a guy I've become friends with lately, and, 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 and he looks at me and he says, Pastor, you mean to tell me that your God will have mercy on those pedophiles, the same mercy that he'll have upon you? And I says, yes, he does. He says, what kind of God is that? That is so unfair. I says, I get it. Let me tell you a little story. Jesus told this. He says, there was a, there was a man, and, and he had a, a harvest field. And so he went out that morning, and he hired workers. And he says, and they, they began work early in the morning. And then he realized that the work was great, so at midday, he went and hired more workers. And they came, and they worked as well. And then later in the evening, about 3 o'clock, he went and hired more workers. And they came into the harvest field and worked. And then at the end of the day, when it came time to pay everybody, the master went to the payroll guy and said, I want you to pay the last employees first that the others might see that they're getting paid. And so those workers came, and they, got, they opened up their envelope, and then worked two hours. I got a full day's wages. Woo! Then those at noon came, and they're like, well, I'll probably get a little bit more. And they opened it up, and they got a full day's wages. Okay. that's. But then those that came early in the morning, they opened it up, and they're like, we're going to make bank on this one, ain't we? And they opened it up, and guess what? They got a full day's wages. But it says they began to grumble and complain. And they went to the master, and they said, what's up? We worked, we toiled from the morning sun to the evening sun, and we got a, a day's wages. And Jesus said, wasn't that the bargain I struck with you? Wasn't that the deal that you would come and work a day's wages? He says, I've not been unfair to you. And he says, is not my possessions, are they not mine to do with as I choose? I can give to whoever who I want, whatever I want. Is that, how is that unfair to you? It's not. That's exactly right. It'd be like you. You know, you walk in, you go to get your paycheck, and you open it up, and yeah, there's a week's pay. And then that new guy that just started last week, he comes in, he gets his paycheck, but then he, oh, there's another check. Five grand. Woo! And you look at him and say, praise God, so happy for you. <laughs> no, you're like, what's up? But your employer has every right to do with his what he wants. You see, God isn't being unfair or unjust when he pours out the same amount of grace on the more sinful than he did on you, who is a little more righteous. Right? No, 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 no. God pours out his grace and his mercy and his compassion with the same measure. We all receive the same measure of grace, folks. Just because we think that other guy's more sinful. No, no, no. The master, the, it's his to do with what he wants. It's not unfair. It's not unjust. That's the point that Paul's making here. And he wants us to understand this. But you know what? God has a plan. God has a plan. All of this, none of this is taking God by surprise. God has a plan. He says, they were prepared beforehand for glory. Verse 24, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. We got the same amount of grace and mercy that God would give the Israelites. For he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, that's us, and who were beloved, who was not beloved, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, for they shall be called sons of the living God. Praise God, that's us. 
such Gentile nations. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. He says, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Unless God had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. God has always left a remnant to represent him and the gospel. Always. He has never allowed it to be taken off the face of the earth. If someone comes to you and says, oh no, we restored the gospel. We reformed the gospel. We brought it back to life. Wrong. God has always left us a seed upon the earth that we would not become like Sodom and Gomorrah who suffered utter destruction because God has a plan. Maybe you don't understand it. Maybe you can't see it. God has a plan. His plan is for rescue and redemption and salvation. God did not enact a plan of destruction. That wasn't his plan. His plan is salvation. And his plan is good for us. It's good for you. It's good for me. It's for us. You remember we just read it? God is for us. God has a purpose for your life and that you would have eternal life in and through Christ Jesus. Whether you're a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. That's the point I believe Paul is making today. God has a purpose for your life. I, I like, you know, we thought that Israel was a great blessed nation, right? A special treasure unto God. 1 Peter 2.9, talking to us, the Gentiles. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You see, God desired to pour out the same mercy, the same blessing upon us that he did to Israel. I find that we're a special treasure unto God. Do you know that? To those who have believed, you're a light that people might sing the praises of God when they see you. I think that's hilarious. But I pray they do. I'd like the worship team to come up and we're going to take communion. And, and so we'll, we'll play this song and they'll um, serve out the elements. And, and I'd like you to wait and we'll all take it together. Okay? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for um, just the amazing truth found in your word, uh, the truth that, um, Lord, it's no amount of work, no amount of labor, no amount of toil that we do uh, that earns us, Lord, your uh, favor, your mercy, Lord, uh, the grace that you pour out on us, God, but it's, uh, it is just that, Lord, it's the grace that you give to us, Lord, the salvation, and Lord, just the beauty in that. Lord, that you desire to see us proclaim your name. Lord, that you desire to see us um, declare you as our Savior and that we don't have to worry, Lord. We don't have to worry, um, Lord, when we say for certain, God, that you are, you are our uh, King, Lord, our Lord. And so, God, we, we take communion today. We, we, Lord, we say, God, that... Uh, with our tongues, Lord, we say that you are, are the Lord of our lives, God. You are the one that saves us. You are the one that um, 
Lord, uh, washes that uh, crimson stain white as snow, Lord. And uh, we thank you, Lord. We want to say thank you and God just uh, worship you for all that you've done, all that you will do, Lord. And uh, sing your praises, Lord. We say this in your name. Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe, and out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the
that puts a smile on my face. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys. Jesus Christ, my living hope. You know, Paul, in 1 Corinthians, you know, we, we, we go to these scriptures and Paul writes about the Last Supper. And, and he, he, he speaks, he says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed and, and he tells this whole story. And I kept wondering, what, where, did, where did Paul hear about that? He wasn't there. I wonder if Jesus revealed it to him. Or, because, you know, when he went to visit the disciples in Jerusalem, they're like, we don't want to meet that guy. We don't like that guy. He's been killing Christians. But somewhere along the line, that, that event was explained to Paul. And Paul grabbed a hold of it. And so he, he talks about it. He says, so on that night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And so as we look at this bread, we look at this and, and we realize that Jesus said, this is my body that's been broken for you. We need to remember, did, have you experienced that? Have you acknowledged that Jesus broke his body for you? That we don't do this out of religious ritual, but this represents something to me. This represents, you know, it says, by his stripes we are healed. His body was broken and bruised and abused for me that I might be healed from those consequences of my sin. And so we take this in, in remembrance, and I pray that you have that. You have that understanding. You, you remember what Jesus did for you. You know, and likewise, it said that uh, Jesus took the cup. And he blessed it. And he said, drink of this. For this is the blood that was shed for many for the remission of sins. Yes, by Jesus' body, we can be healed of the consequences of our sin. But it's the blood that was shed that saves us. And Jesus had once told his disciples, if you refuse to eat of my body or drink of my blood, you have no part in me. And so we look at this and, and, and we realize this is symbolic of the blood that was shed for me, that was poured out for me on my behalf. That God loved me so much that he shed his blood for me. And so we remember You know, and he said, as often as you do this, you proclaim my death until I come again. And so, yes, we proclaim that the Lord was crucified and was buried in a grave and that he was raised to life on the third day. And that he ascended and he sits on the right hand of the father. Even now, we were just in Romans chapter eight, right? And it says that Jesus sits on the right hand of the father and intercedes on our behalf. To those who have trusted in Jesus, there is salvation. And because of that, he sits on the right hand of the Father and argues your case before the world. <coughs> that you are free and clear of the guilt of your sin. If you have not accepted Jesus, I know I'm probably speaking to the choir. I know we're all born again. I mean, I look at y'all and go, my gosh, Lord, they're all more righteous than I. But I, I can't judge a man's heart. And so we just put it out there to you. Have you trusted and believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you accepted the gift of God through Christ Jesus, the blood that was shed for you, the pure and spotless Lamb of God that was crucified on your behalf? Have you received that for yourself? Have you confessed that before God? 
and before men that you are a believer, that you are a child of God because of the lamb that was slain. If you have not, I would encourage you to do that. Enter in through the narrow gate that you might find eternal life. Amen? Can we play another stanza of that? You just tell us where you're going, Matt, and we'll join in. Would you like to stand with us? But hallelujah. <laughs> That's the part I like. Hallelujah. Dwayne, would you come close us out in prayer? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I'd just like to thank you for your Holy Spirit and thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for the message, and I just pray over everyone as they leave today that you'll just watch over and protect them. there and and spread your word and and do the great commission that we go out and make and make disciples and thank you for all you do for us in Jesus name amen good job yeah then I started too slow then I started too fast <laughs> <laughs>